All right, so uh, some of you were not here last week, so you missed, a, in my opinion, was a really uh, great message. Um, not so much because of the delivery, I suppose, but because I really like the way that, uh, that the Lord spoke through Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 5. So I'd like to remind you again that I've got CDs back there in the box. I noticed that last week nobody seemed to be very enthusiastic to take any. So maybe this week you will. You know, maybe, maybe you know, I've got three weeks worth of CDs back there, and hardly, or you know, or at least maybe that's a reflection of nobody contributing anything to the cost of them. <laughs> maybe you did, and I didn't know it. Um, let me just mention that that, um, that I do. I, I could use some help to pay for the cost of the production of that. If you can put something in the box towards that, it would really be helpful. Um, but if not, at least you know it's more important for me to move that material. Uh, than it is. Uh, so if you don't want to pay for it, I of course will. I don't have a problem with that. I'm just asking for some offset concerning that. If you can help me offset that. And that's kind of been the way it's gone. So <clears throat> those are available to back there. Please make sure you take those. It will be a, a significant time lag uh, between uh, the upload to YouTube. And, uh, and so just because of that time lag, you know, just give me a uh, uh, a chance for that, you can pick up the audio CDs and hear those right away. A little bit more convenient to listen to in the car. All right, so for the sake of the recording, you might notice that uh, my voice is not exactly the best. It's just because I'm really tired. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night for various reasons. Please, you know, trust me, I am not medicated. All right, I, I didn't even drink a lot. Of, I didn't even drink any coffee this morning. I just decided, you know, I'm just not going to do that. So I got no coffee, and I got no rest, and you know I got no nothing. So you get to see me for who I really am. I really value a lot. I hope you can have an appreciation for that too. Let me do a little bit of a review for last week. For some of you who were not here, because um, it's I think it's really uh, valuable when it comes to uh, understanding what happens next. I did not hand out those sheets from last week, and, and I don't think I have any more with me. So. Well, I don't know what to tell you. Besides that, you're just out of luck. <laughs> okay. Uh, but what I was emphasizing last week was, was uh, a statement that the Lord made in response to the situation at hand. The statement that He had made was, What more could I have done? And of course, you've you got to take that from, uh, you've got to consider it from multiple point of views. Okay, what more could I have done? I'm going to start in Isaiah chapter 5. This is in the, uh, the translation that I've produced, starting in verse 3. Uh, so in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 3, I believe that this is a more accurate rendition uh, of what this says. He says, And now, one dwelling in Jerusalem, a man of Judah, judge now between me and between my vineyard. Let me have it. Come on, pass some judgment against me. You might think, my goodness, how could anyone dare say something like that? Aren't we always supposed to defend ourselves? And he says, no, go ahead and attack. Come on, let me have it. What more, verse 4, what more am I to do for my vineyard, and what did I not do for it? Wherefore, I waited for it to yield grapes, and it yielded a foul rot. And I believe it's a much better rendition of the ending of that. Uh, in your translations, it probably says something like wild grapes. Okay? That's not what it says. There are ways of writing foul, uh, wild grapes. We don't have a problem with that in Hebrew. We've got words for that. The words that he chose to use, I believe, represent foul rot. Okay? That's what he says. So he says, what more could I have done? What could I have done? What could I have not done? Listen, folks. Don't be so surprised when you find yourself in life situations where it isn't going to matter what you do or what you don't do. Now, if you've never encountered a situation like that, I want you to know that I have great envy towards you. I just, I'll confess my sin. Because, you know, envy is a sin. And I will covet, you know, whatever that situation is. Okay, because I encounter that a lot. And, and, and so to, to see the Lord encounter something like this, where He realizes that, that, that he, he, you know, there is, it doesn't matter. All right? Now, now think about this from the New Covenant point of view for just a moment, so that you can appreciate the value of this. It shouldn't matter. All right? And it's okay to fail. Okay? It's okay to fail. Why is it okay to fail? Because we're dealing with the issues relative to the flesh. 
I mean, could he really avoid a foul rot? When we're talking about you know, the, the aspects of the flesh here, there is no way to avoid it. Okay, there's no way. And so you might wonder, well, then what do we do in life? Well, sometimes we try to have as little foul rot as possible. You know, when you have to make choices sometimes between bad and really bad, usually it's better to go for bad, you know, than really bad. I mean, that's what we end up with sometimes, right? You know, when we don't end up with situations like that, that's a time to really rejoice, isn't it? You know, but in general, this is, this is the situation in life. And so when the Lord is confronted with this, and when He challenges them over this, all right, you should not be surprised, which is why I said last week, you may, you may have missed it, when I said that the, the, the response that the people should have said, when He said, come on, pass judgment, you decide, you pass judgment, you tell me what I should do or what I should not do, how I should intervene or how I should not intervene, come on, give me your ideas. Let me have it. I'm listening. All right? To use the Fraser Crane example. All right? I'm listening. Right. He said it a little bit differently. He says, I'm listening. Okay? But I mean, I'm trying to exaggerate it from a Jewish point of view. I mean, I mean, use that. You know, we wouldn't say, I'm listening. You know, we wouldn't say it that way, except in strategic opportunities. But in this case, you know, he, he's saying he's challenging them, right? He's challenging them. And of course, the, I believe that the most appropriate response, if the Lord spoke to me and said, Aaron, come on, pass some judgment on me. I'd say, okay, Lord, I'm going to give it to you. Send me to hell. That's the right decision. That's the right decision. You're right. Okay? It wouldn't matter what you... You're right in the sense that you did everything you could and you didn't do those things that you shouldn't have done. That is the judgment. You are right. There is nothing left. Let the vineyard collapse. Let it fall apart. Let the nation of Israel die. Let slavery occur. That is the law. That is what is right. Let it play out. But instead, what do people do? They say things, they say things like, okay, Lord, you know, I've got a good list for you. Thank you for the opportunity. I got some judgment for you. You know, you should have done this. You should have done this. You should have done this, and you should have done this. And then we got other attitudes, like, you know, it's either you should have intervened or you should not have intervened. You should not have gotten in the way of this. And you should not have gotten in the way of that. There are people who have that kind of an attitude. All right, I know that might sound a little surprising, but they do. You open yourself up to them and they will let you have it. Okay? And then there's other people who will respond on the defensive. And they will say, oh no, Lord, you are God. Bless your name. You know, don't ask me what to do. You are the one. We will wait for your decision. Well, they, they, they didn't respond to his decisions before. He told them what to do, what not to do. Gave them the law. They wouldn't do it. So what, what, what makes you think that they're going to do that now? Right? I mean, they could, they could respond with this. I will do anything you say. And you know what the right response is to that. No, you won't. <laughs> no, you, no, you won't. All right, so, uh, so people can respond either aggressively or defensively, but either way, it's still sin. It's sin through judging God by telling Him what He should have done, it's sin by telling God that you will do whatever He declares, because you're not. Instead of saying, just judge me and send me to hell. Right? We can say that in the New Covenant because we know that we depend on His mercy anyway. Right? I mean, we so, what's wrong with giving up? What's, why, can't, you know, why can't we give up? You know, this is, a, this is an obstacle that exists within the Jewish community a lot. You encounter uh, a religious Jew uh, of today, 
and ask them, do you believe in God? And it's very common to find someone, find one who says, you know, I kind of do, but I don't like him. Because, you know, because of this, because of that, because what? Because he should have intervened, and he didn't. And the Holocaust, you know, that happened in Germany is the most common example to pick in this day and age. You know, there was so much death and so much destruction, he could have intervened. But because he didn't, either there is no God or he is evil. It's the same response. God could ask them, judge me. What could I have done there? What, could I, what should I not have done there? And there are lots of people who would be very, very excited to respond and to really let him know what they think instead of recognizing that they have a need for mercy, personally themselves. And that maybe he did give them some warning for warnings and saying, get out of there while you can, which he did to a number of people who responded that way. And you might wonder, well, you know, is there, you know, is there any other time when things like that have happened? We're reading about it right now. Same thing in Isaiah, the days of Isaiah. When the Assyrians came down and slaughtered everyone, and those people, you know, take some time to, to, to examine the, uh, the archaeological discoveries that we have concerning the Assyrian army and the way that they waged war. And you think what happened in Germany was bad? Okay, that was nothing in comparison with what was experienced shortly after the Lord spoke to the people here. And then the Babylonians came down and they finished things off. They weren't as bad as the Assyrians, but they still finished things off. Alright, so we have a long, glorious history of example after example to show that the Lord has no problem with stepping aside and letting things play out. You want Him to intervene? Well, you wanted Him to intervene before. He did intervene and you didn't like it when He did. So what about now? What about now? That's what he says. He says, I planted the vineyard. I pruned. I tilled. I cared for it. I watered. I made it. He cleared the stones, right? He set up the boundaries. He did it all. And they certainly enjoyed the benefit of that for a while, didn't they? But how did they respond? They responded with their sin. Now consider the passages in the previous chapter. Remember that verse that I mentioned where I read, where the people claimed, and this is not available in the current translations. You have to re refer back to the, to, to the work that I did previously. Remember what they said when they said, look at what we have done through His fingers, where people were laying claim to other people's labor, saying that it was theirs. You know, there are people like that who live in such a way that all they do is look for something to take. That's all they do. That's all that they have in their being. That is their contribution to society. And, you know, it's kind of a twisted perception for many people. They really believe that that is their contribution because it makes the person who they took from kind of, you know, look good, especially if it was given voluntarily in some way, because it makes the other person look generous makes the other person look, look good, that they provided, right? So they actually provided the service by taking from what somebody else provided, or what somebody else invented, or what somebody else created. People are always, not always, but there are many people who live looking for someone else's productivity so that they can lay claim to someone else's productivity. And there are lots of creative ways to lay claim to someone else's property, someone else's intellect, someone else's accomplishments. And they can esteem a sense of value. They esteem value by being the recipients. They provide a service for being the recipients. And so when God provided all of this value, all of this knowledge, he provided so much for these people. There were many people who would take the attitude of we are the ones who make God look good. We're the ones who make God look good. Because without us, He wouldn't have a people that He could bless. So we provide our service by giving Him someone to bless. And of course, for every service, there must be compensation. So now... 
God owes them. God, God owes them. Because they provided the service of being the recipients of His blessings. Now perhaps you have encountered people in your life like that. If you haven't, consider yourself fortunate. If not yet, you may in the future. You may encounter someone who has that kind of an attitude towards you. And they'll let you know eventually, especially when things get cut off. They'll tell you, you owe me. I owe you? Yeah, you owe me. Because I made you look good. <laughs> okay? Or whatever. I mean, there's various ways that people will say that. Now, how do you pay that debt? How you, you can't pay the debt. I mean, how, how could God pay the debt? Could He give them another vineyard? Would that compensate them? No, because they are now doubling their service. So now He's doubly indebted. Does that make sense? Alright, I know that might be difficult to follow. Please try to listen to the audio to this again. Put it on pause on occasion and take notes. But you end up in a scenario, when you're dealing with a, a scenario like that, there is no way to win. There is no way to get out of debt. God will never get out of debt. Because the more He provides, the more He's indebted. The more He gives, the more He's indebted. Alright, now, what do, you, what do you do? Now, that's the name... No, that's, let me say, that's another way of explaining the flesh and how the flesh can never be satisfied. It's another way of revealing that and understanding that. That the more you give to the flesh, the more it wants or the more it expects. This is another, another model that you could use in order to have an understanding of how the flesh will never be satisfied. Because that really is where it's coming from. All right? So, so God is in this position where He has been giving and giving and giving and giving. And people are not getting adequately compensated to their satisfaction. How long will it be before they turn to sin? That just depends on the person. Eventually, they're going to turn to sin. When you don't compensate people in your life adequately for the service that they provided by taking whatever you gave, They're going to eventually turn to sin. And it's either going to be manifested directly towards you in violence, either verbal or whatever, or it's going to be manifested in some other way. You will see a person pursuing compensation in whatever way they can take it when they can't get proper compensation for the service of taking everything you have. All right? So that's what they saw. That's what the Lord saw. Excuse me. That's what the Lord saw. Was He saw them eventually follow other gods. Eventually turn to sin. Because He was not able to meet their needs. He was not able to fulfill their flesh. It's only a matter of time before they abandon Him and pursue sin or address Him in the context of violence which would quickly be seen if he says, Judge me! And they'd say, Alright, I've got something for you. That's what I mean in terms of violence. Does that make sense? Now, I know that's a mouthful, I know that's a lot. But that's what it says here. And so I'm letting you know what it says. Trying to give you some more insights with regards to the interaction that's taking place. And can give you a better appreciation for what he says next. What he says next is... I give up! Which is a wonderful stage to be in. Okay? I give up! He said, I give up! Alright? That's what I just handed out to you. God saying He gives up. Starting in verse 5. And now I will know, now to all of you, that which I am doing to my vineyard, to take away its hedge, and it will be burned. Now I know this is a little bit awkward, um, but try to bear with me. It's just because of the language barrier. Um, to take down its wall, and it will be for trampling. Now, if you read through uh, the existing translations that we have, and I should do that right now. I'm going to read through the New King James Version in just a moment. Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. I'll tell you, it kind of gives you the impression that the Lord is reacting. It is as if He is reacting and saying, Alright, you want to just go ahead and sin? 
and you just want to just go ahead and reject me for who I am and for what I have to offer. If, if that's the way that you want to you want to handle it, I'm just going to destroy everything. But he doesn't quite say it like that. He says it differently. You got to keep reading. But in the existing translations, I don't think that they reveal that very well. Let me show you. Beginning in verse 5 in the New King James. And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall. It shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. That is in the New King James. But in the translation that I have provided, it says something very different. Okay? Especially when it comes to that rain. He actually says that he will still bring the rain. Okay? Which says something a lot more than just, I'm going to stop the rain. Okay? So please understand that in this, in these, in this version, and probably the other ones, which I have not been able to take the time to take, to take a look at, but I would expect them to be quite similar. It gives you the impression that he is going to take direct action. That he is going to intervene to ensure the destruction of all that he created. Or shall I say, all that they created through his hands. He's going to take away from them. Can you get the sense for what the people might be thinking or how they might be feeling? The people then, when they would hear him say something like this, they would hear as the, as they would hear him threatening them. That's how they would hear it. They would say, you're threatening me because you're going to take away those things that are mine. And he's saying, no, I'm just going to take away those things that I created. And he's not going to have to do much in order to accomplish that. No real intervention is required in order to take away those things that you create through your own hands. I mean, consider the labor that you perform and those who benefit from it, if anybody does. You probably work really hard. And what you produce, someone else gets to, if you produce more than what you consume, somebody else is probably going to enjoy some of the difference. If you stop, Providing that, for whatever reason, either because you can't, or because you're tired, or you know, who knows what. It doesn't matter what the reason is. The other person is going to see you as a thief. You have no way to avoid it. They're going to say, you are evil, you are the criminal, because you have failed to give me what is mine. There's no way to avoid it. There will be that kind of an attitude. The Lord provided, now He's going to take it away, and they're going to have that attitude towards Him as if He is the evil one. How does He do it? Nothing. Okay, He, he will do nothing. The first sentence in verse 5 is nothing more than a declaration of the result. And I know this might sound a little bit awkward, but this is, and I hate to use this, it almost sounds like a cliche. This is a Hebraic way of thinking, all right? In, in, the, in, 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 the, in the way that you're used to thinking, you're used to thinking about um, a bunch of uh, specifics, and then you generalize a conclusion from all your specifics. In the Hebraic way of thinking, you, uh, you start with your generalizations, and then you go to specifics. Okay, uh, I have shown this in a number of examples when, when going through verse-by-verse -verse studies in the New Testament uh, in the past. You've, if you've heard my verse-by-verse -verse studies, you will inevitably you'll run into one of those scenarios where I have presented the passages from that point of view. For those of you who are uh, technologically minded, uh, this is uh, what's called a recursive line of thought. Uh, uh, that's one way of looking at it. If you're uh, mathematically minded, it would be expressed with what's called a recurrence relation. Um, if you're philosophically minded, uh, well, there's just a lot more to say, and so I'm not going to get into that because then we're going to have this philosophical discussion. But uh, uh, that's the best I can do for now. Um, start with the general and then get into specifics instead of dealing with a bunch of specifics and then seeing how they apply 
in general context. It's a different paradigm of thought. So he's going to start by giving you the end result, but he's not going to tell you how he's going to get there until the next verse. Okay? That's why I say that. That's my bias. All right? That's my bias as I'm taking that point of view. Beginning uh, in verse, I'll begin again in verse 5 in the translation I just handed out. And now I will know, now to all of you, that which I am doing to my vineyard. He says, now I will know. And, I, and, and in, a, in a sense, he is declaring to all of them, but he wrote it and he said, he, he said it and it was recorded in a way that indicates that he knows that nobody's listening. No, he knows that nobody is listening to him. All right? That's, that's what I personally get from this. Uh, now to all of you, that which I am doing to my vineyard to take away it, that which I am doing to take away. Can you get that sense? He's telling you what the end result is, but he's not telling you the specifics of how he is going to do this. He says, that which I am doing to my vineyard to take away its hedge, and it will be burned. Future tense hasn't happened yet, hasn't given you the details about how it's going to happen. To take down its wall, and it will be for trampling. This is all future tense. Verse 6 is where he begins to say how this will be accomplished. <coughs> and I will make it as if nothing had been there. That's future tense. This is how he's going to do it. It, beginning of the next sentence, it will not be pruned, and it will not be cultivated, and briars will grow, and thorns. And I will command the clouds to cause rain to rain upon it, which is a statement to say that he's not going to intervene in the rains, but that he is going to allow the rains to come like they normally would. All right, And he will do so by commandment if necessary. Instead of saying, there, thou shalt not have rain, or there shall be no rain. In the law, the law says on a number of occasions that if you sin, he will keep the rain from coming. In this case, he says, I'm going to make sure the rain comes. I'm going to make sure of it. Can you hear the difference? There's a difference in paradigm. All right? And it's a, to me, it's a statement of non-intervention. It's a statement of just simply withdrawing. That's it. That's all he's got left. He's just going to withdraw. He says, I'm not going to prune it. I'm not going to till it. He's not going to work the vineyard. He's not going to do it anymore. He's going to let the thorn bushes and the briars grow. They grow anyway. He's going to let it happen. Eventually, the, 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 the hedges will come down. The rain will come. And what will the rain water? All the thorns and briars and everything you don't want to grow. And the vineyard will be choked out. So what will he do? What is his intervention? His intervention is nothing. Which is a way of saying, come on people, you judge, you tell me what to do. You tell me what not to do. And until you do, I won't do anything. You decide. Let's do it your way. Come on. Let's do it your way. That's all he's got left. He's got nothing left. Now what happens when there's failure? They'll just blame him. Okay? They'll blame him. There is no escape for God. No escape for God. He's going to lose. Either way. Alright? He's going to lose either way. If he intervenes or he doesn't intervene. Can you see that? He's going to lose either way. It doesn't matter. It's the flesh. You should expect loss. You should expect failure. He's going to lose either, what, what he, if he does or if he doesn't do. All he's got at his disposal is a dual gambit with a fork. All right? Let it collapse. Let it fall. No matter which way it goes, he will come out on top. No matter which way it goes. If they decide to follow his ways, things will be extended, right? And then they'll collapse. But they'll be extended if they choose not to. 
Things will dissolve, which is what happened. And then the stage will be set for the coming of the Messiah in the way that it was. He had no way to lose. It was either extinction or the proper timing for the presentation of the Messiah. Now he did give timing later for the coming of the Messiah. And when was that timing given? It was during the Babylonian captivity, the captivity of these people. And that time, that clock started in the captivity. So if these people would have followed his ways and delayed things a little longer, the clock would have started a little later. But it still would have happened. There's no way to avoid it. Salvation will come. The new covenant will be invoked. The old covenant will fail. There will be destruction and there will be resurrection and restoration. It's going to happen in a different way. You just got to give it some time and let it play itself out. That's what he says. Okay? That's how things go. There are many circumstances in life that are like this. Not all, but they do occur. Let them go. Let them play out. This is not anything unusual. God has seen this himself. All right? So, we are here. Verse, uh, verse 6. He says, it will not be pruned, it will not be cultivated. Now, you know, that, that to me, those words, you know, the pruning and the cultivation, remember how Jesus used those words in the context of the vine. John chapter 15, where he talked about the vine and the branches, and there's a necessity for a cultivation, for a pruning to occur. Now, this happens both in the Old Covenant and in, in the New Covenant. It just happens in different ways. But it still happens. Right? In the Old Covenant, we see the, the, the pruning and the cultivation through increased condemnation. In the New Covenant, we see the pruning and the cultivation through increased reconciliation. In the Old Covenant, through an increase in condemnation is the pruning and the cultivating in the Old Covenant. And in the New Covenant, it's an increase in reconciliation and a drawing close to your God that is the experience of the pruning and the cultivating that happens in your life. In one sense, it is a, in the Old Covenant, it is a further revelation of the existence of the sin. In the New Covenant sense, the sin never goes away, of course, in, in the sense, in some ways you may see a reduction and you may even see a removal, but the true cultivation and the pruning actually takes place in your discovery and application of the inheritance that you have in Christ Jesus and growing in your understanding of His love for you. Alright? So it happens in a different way. He still is not going to deal with, the, deal with the sin issue in the sense of getting your flesh perfected. If you don't believe me, you just got to stick with it a little bit longer and try to get your flesh perfected. And when you give up, let me know and you'll be ready for what I just said. Alright? But if you're not ready for that, don't feel bad. All right? Just be more sincere, okay? Be more committed and work on that pruning and cultivating in your life and get all that sin out of your life and, and, and get some more condemnation. If you need an accountability partner, I'm sure you can find you one probably from another church, but we can find you one, all right? You know what I mean, right? Look, I'm making a lot of assumptions about the things that you've heard me say in the past, okay? If that's a little bit too much for you, please have some patience with me. Forgive me. Have mercy listen to me for a little bit longer, you'll eventually catch up on what I'm referring to. Alright? But what I want you to understand is this pruning and cultivating. He says, I'm going to stop. Alright? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. And he doesn't need to do it in order for it to happen. Because we can do it to ourselves, right? Okay? I remember one time in my life as I decided to pursue self-introspection. Have you ever done that before? If you haven't done that before, it takes, it's, really, it's really an experience. Self-introspection. After a couple weeks, I was so beaten down, somebody said I should be medicated. Because I really saw me for who I was. Right? Um, you know, so you don't need the Lord's intervention when it comes to these kinds of things. We can beat ourselves up just fine, just the same. And if you don't, there, there, there must be someone in your life who will do that for you. You know, or you'll eventually get someone in your life who will do that for you. People provide that service for others all the time. 
All right, so eventually it's going to happen, the, the pruning and the cultivation. But the Lord says, I'm not going to do it. Now try to recall what I ended with last week when I said that there is no end to something. Okay, where there is no end. If you, you've got to listen to see the end of the message I did last week. I said that there, that there is no end. And what was I uh, Oh, to the, to the bearing of fruit, to the discovery of who He is. But especially, uh, I described this, this hedge that we seem to have in our lives when we first come to know the Lord and we rest in His grace and we rest in His love. But it seems like we have this hedge around us that we stay in this little subtle place. But then we realize that there's some holes in there that, seems to kind of, that seem to kind of leave us open to life circumstances. And it looks really scary. But it's these life circumstances that the Lord often uses in order to increase our knowledge and understanding of who He is. And that He opens things up. And through that, He teaches us more. We discover more of who He is. That's where I was ending last week, was with, the, with, with, with trying to give you an understanding that, that you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're going to say this to yourself. There seems to be no end to the work of God in my life. There seems to be no end to the continual revelations of who He is in my life. There seems to be no end to the number of uh, trials or the number of, of, of awkward or challenging circumstances that He uses in order to, to, to work. And there seems to be no end to that. Instead of just resting and, and, and just hiding in His love, He leaves you, He leaves some things open. And He uses those to increase the knowledge of that. That's where I ended last week. And, 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 and what I want you to, to consider is that in the New Covenant, there's not supposed to be an end. Alright? There's, there's, there, there is no end. In the Old Covenant, there is an end. But in the New Covenant, there is no end. Alright? So when it comes to the, 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 the threat of it will not be pruned, and it will not be cultivated, what you're hearing is you're hearing the end from the New Covenant. <coughs> But in, I mean, from the Old Covenant, you're hearing, the, you're hearing the ending of that, where he finally, finally makes an absolute declaration that there's no saving the flesh. Okay? To say that he will not prune and he will not cultivate is, in effect, a formal declaration that, he's, that he will not try to reclaim the flesh. He will give up on that. In the New Covenant, through the resurrection by His Spirit into a new creation that we are now, the pruning and the cultivating take place in a different way as you have begun to experience, if you've been in the, in, in the New Covenant for a while or growing in it, you've begun to discover the pruning and the cultivation in your beliefs, right? Whereas you did not believe, but now you believe, you did not trust, but now you trust, you did not know, but now you know. That is a pruning and cultivating that He is doing in your heart, in your spirit. Not your flesh, but in your spirit, in your soul, in your being. You did not know Him at all. Now you know Him a little. Later, you will know Him a little more and a little more. And is there any end to that? No. There is no end to the pruning and cultivation in the New Covenant. So when we see this, you know, in the flesh we might hear it as a tremendous threat. No more pruning, no more cultivating. But in the Spirit we can say, yeah, let's give it up. Okay? Let's give it up. Because in the flesh there is nothing. In the dead man there is nothing. But death and foul rot you should expect with something that's dead, right? There's nothing there. Remember the old person. There was no one there. There wasn't the Lord, and there wasn't even you, when you consider who you are now. I know what it is to be lost, and I remember the dead man who I once was. And boy, that was awful. And I know the living man who is alive now. Who's got plenty of awful things as well, but I can at least make a comparison and be thankful 
At least I can be thankful and be appreciative. Can I at least have that? Okay, I can have that. All right, that's what I mean. That before I could easily say that I had nothing. Not only was I nothing, and not only was the Lord not there, but I was not there either. And can you say that now? That who you are now is not who was there back when. There was no one there. Who was there was nothing. Was death, was foul rot, is not even worthy of having a name. Not even worthy of having a name. But the resurrected person is, is, is one who has a name, who has been given by God. For those of you who can recall that reference of that special stone of the name, I'll just leave it there. Because I have to keep going. Uh, with verse 7. For a vineyard of Hashem of hosts was the house of Israel, and a man of Judah a plant of his delight. And he looked for justice and beheld oppression, for righteousness and beheld a cry of distress. These are the specifics with, with, with reference to the previous verses in this chapter. Remember I told you going from the general to the specific. The previous verses, the beginning of the chapter, hint at the notion that it's talking about the people. But it is here that he gets into the specifics and he says, I really am talking about you, the people, not the grapes and the vines that you see in the land. But you, you, the people, this is not about the vineyard in that sense, in the flesh. It's not about the grapes. It's not about the wine. It's not about the obedience. It's not about the repentance. It's not about the sin. It's about the people. The, the people. And then the people, he looks at them and there's no one there. Alright? Going back to previous chapter, it's like they're foreigners. Right? They don't even belong there. That kind, of, that kind of statement. He gets into it in more detail. Keep reading. In verse 8. Whoa! To those reaching out, house to house, field to field. Now in the in the New King James Version, which I'm not going to read right now, it gives you the impression that they're that they're uh, consolidating. Consolidating fields and uh, and reducing houses, <clears throat> like you would see in some some countries where you see a lot of bankruptcies and people leave their farms and you just do consolidations until you get uh, large corporate farms, for example, and then you get one big house there and they just own all the fields. Uh, that, that, that does happen over a period of time due to the failures that take place. The Lord has a provision for that. The year of Jubilee is given for that in order to return the land or return a piece of land back to uh, individuals so that they can restart and rebuild life for themselves. So there's a provision for that through the law of Jubilee. However, uh, here there could be the impression that the law of Jubilee is not being uh, followed. That's one way of looking at it, and so there's a consolidation. But I personally do not see the emphasis being on the fields or on the houses, as you will see re rendered in the other translations. <coughs> to me, what I see uh, is a coalition that's being built that the people start discovering that they're alone, right? Because the Lord isn't there. And so they're discovering that they're kind of alone. And so they need some more friends. And so they start reaching out to each other. And they start building coalitions with people. And this happens a lot when people run out of stuff to take from somebody else. If you run out of stuff to take, then you need to find some more people to take from. So we'll build a coalition of people and say, we just need more people together. You know, a, a good example is, is when you see uh, Ponzi schemes, okay, or pyramid schemes. If you think the pyramid scheme is going to collapse, don't worry. Just get more people enrolled. All right, that's the attitude that I, I personally believe is a better rendition of verse 8 where he says, Woe to those reaching out, house to house, field to field. They will bring them together. And I don't think they're talking about the houses or the fields. I think, it, I believe that they're talking about the people in the houses, the people in the fields. Until the end of searchable space. I enjoy translating that one. So, so you know. <laughs> that he said that they will do this 
until the end of searchable space, and you will dwell for yourselves in the midst of the earth. Which is a statement that says you will continue to dwell for your own self-interest in the midst of the earth, in your coalition of all these people that you managed to search for and bring together, you will now be able to live for yourselves and you will take everything until there is nothing left. Nothing left. Now this is, of course, a personification of someone who uh, is spiritually dead and is not following the Lord. There is inherently no one there, right? Verse 9. In my ears, Hashem of hosts, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, if not many great houses go to desolation, they will become great ones, and good ones where there is no one dwelling. What he says is that if not many great houses go to desolation, it's a way of saying there's going to be some destruction here. There are going to be some houses that fall to desolation, that break down, especially when you go all the way to that to that unsearchable, you know, to where there's no no longer any searchable space to find anyone, and you bring them together in a coalition. There are places that are going to, there are houses that are going to just end, end up being abandoned. There are houses that are going to fail. <clears throat> but don't worry, there might be some that might survive. And I believe that that's what he's saying here. If not many great houses go to, go to desolation, they will become great ones. So the ones that do not go to desolation, they will become great. It's a way of saying, look, I'm going to pull back. And I'm going to just let you do whatever you want. You decide. And if you survive, good for you. Okay? You survive, good for you. You find a way to make it work, you make it work. You know, in the world and in the flesh, people make things work, right? I mean, he's talking about Judah, the land of Israel. What about the other nations around? What about Egypt? Right? What, what, what about uh, Phrygia? You know, I mean, what about other that region? I don't think they were a country at that time. Uh, the, the other, there's plenty of other places. What about the people in India? What about the people over in China? I mean, those people had great houses and they were operational to a degree. It's his way of saying, if you can find a way to make it work, you might be able to do that. And whatever is left after all the desolation might be somewhat semi-functional. Okay? Just like all the other pagans. And then you can be like everybody else, right? Which is what everybody wants to be, right? Like everybody else. Not me, but you know. <clears throat> a lot of people feel that that is the model by which you resolve your issues. Mm -hmm. Is you just become like everybody else, and then you don't. Then you got more friends. Like that. I mean, there's lots to say about that. He says they will become great ones <clears throat> and good ones where there is no one dwelling. Where there is no one dwelling. Now, you've got to know the Lord in order to know what He's saying here, in my opinion. Okay. So, consider that to be my bias. How can He say that there are houses that remain, that seem to be functional, and yet there's no one dwelling in that? I mean, how would you compare that with the ones that fell apart and went to desolation because there was no one dwelling in You can know that if you know what it means to say that a dead man has no one there. Okay? That when a person is spiritually dead, there's no one there. Not only is there no God, but there is no real person from his point of view either. Until a person is resurrected and born again by the Spirit of God, there is no one there. So the best that they can possibly achieve is a great house with empty people. A great house with empty people. That will be the maximum that they will be able to achieve on their own. And from God's point of view, there's no one there. Which is a great place to be. Because perhaps one day they'll discover that. And hopefully, that will occur at the appropriate time. 
when they are ready to receive the mercy of God so that they may know the Messiah, be born again by the Spirit, and start over. That's the message. That is Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, where there is no one dwelling from his point of view. Okay, so that's a uh, great warm-up into chapter 5. Uh, come back next week, and uh, I'll try to tell you what more I can discover this week. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time that we could spend to review what you had to say to the people back then and how that may relate to our understanding of the new covenant today. Lord, I pray that through all of this, you will reveal more of who you are so that we can see the world through your eyes and hear the world through your ears. And thank you. Thank you for reminding me. You just reminded me that when he said through his ears at the beginning of verse 9, that corresponds to what he said about the heavens and the earth and their ears before. But now he will be the witness. That Lord, thank you for reminding me of that. Please remind me to start with that next week. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.